hello students we continue our discussion on memory interfacing although i when i have given an overview of hierarchical memory organization in this lecture we are primarily concerned on the synthesis of main memory main memory devices so uh, we shall continue our discussion on main memory interfacing in the last lecture uh, we have discussed about different types of main memory devices ram their internal structure and how the chip is organized read only memory different types of read only memories like mass programmable rom where the programming is done while fabrication in the factory then electrically programmable rom where the programming can be done electrically with the help of eeprom programmer and erasing can be done by expo exposing the chip you know the chip is available with an optical port so in case of electrically programmable rom uh, the chip can be exposed to ultraviolet light uv light and that will uh, erase the uh, all the chip contents memory contents on the other hand in electrically erasable programmable rom the programming erasing can be done electrically however it has been found to be unreliable costly and uh, available the uh, packaging density is higher so the ultimate uh, solution is to have flash memory where uh, we, we can do erasing electrically however all the memory locations can be erased simultaneously in a flash in comparison to erasing uh, byte by byte in electrically programmable rom so we have already discussed and we have also discussed the different types of chip organizations available for different types of memories uh, if we summarize the chip organization you will notice that the irrespective of the device that we are using ram rom or any type of rom the typical organization will have a number of address line so here you have got the address lines and there are n address line with the help of which you can access uh, two to the power n uh, memory locations you will have one or few read write control line so read write control for read write control you will require few lines and that number can vary minimum requirement is at least one by which the, the uh, you can specify whether you are performing read operation or write operation similarly you may require you will require one or few chip select line and with the help of which you can select a particular chip however you will require few more additional lines depending on the type of memory for example if it is a programmable rom you will require few lines for programming and so on similarly you will require few lines for data and say m and whenever you are having n at this lines and m data lines we call it 2 to the power n into m organization of the memory chip obviously in a chip the most important parameter is the pin count pin count plays a very important role because all the flsi chips are packaged in dual in line package and the number of pins provided in the chip decides the cost of the device so uh, pin count plays a very important role and it has been found that lower the number of pins lower is the cost higher the number of pins higher is the cost so uh, with the objective of reducing the number of pins sometimes the chips are organized in terms of bits where m is equal to one that means you have only one uh, line for data input and output on the other hand whenever uh, you want to make the chip byte organized that means all the uh, if you want to access one byte at a time then we can call it that it is byte organized where m is equal to 8 so it has been found that 
chips are available with in bit organized form as well as byte organized form in both forms. Now uh, uh, let us have a look at the different types of uh, memory chips organized in different ways. This is 6116 SRAM with 2K into 8 organization. As you can see here, these are the address lines with 11 address lines with the help of which you can access to the, to, to the 2K memory locations. And here you have got eight data lines, so D0 to 7. So the organization is 2K into 8. And this chip select and output enable, these are essentially for chip selection. And with the help of this write enable, you can perform uh, writing. Uh, and whenever this is one, you can perform reading of this SRAM, static RAM. So this is a 2K into 8 organization, chip is 6116. Similarly, you can have dynamic RAM 4164. And as you can see here, it is bit organized. That means you, ha you, you have 64K into one. And as you can see, you have got only one output line and one input line. And moreover, to reduce the chip count here, you can see, although you have got 64K, which requires 16 address lines, but you are providing eight lines uh, on the chip for, for address, uh, for, to provide the address. So you provide row address and column address uh, in a time division multiplex form. So you have to read the row address first, followed by column address. And obviously the interfacing will require a, uh, some kind of dynamic RAM controller, which will generate a controller will be required uh, for generating this row at the select signal, column at the select signal, because these signals will not be generated by the microprocessor. On the other hand, write enable is used for the purpose of reading from the chip, uh, writing into the chip, and whenever this is one, you can read from the chip, from any locations within the chip. And moreover, the DRAM controller will, op will also perform uh, memory refreshing, as we have already discussed, which is required Repressing. Repressing requires because in dynamic rank the information is lost if it is not repressed as at regular interval. On the other hand, here you have got the chief organization of an EPROM, electrically programmable ROM, which can be erased with the help of ultraviolet light of the chip. And here also you have got 2K into 8 organization. So this is the address line. These are the address lines. These are your data lines. And here, as you can see, you require a special pin for programming. Here, this pin serves the dual purpose. When it is used online for reading data, then this is this is used as chip select or chip enable. Whenever you are programming, then it, then you have to, for this, this will act as a programming pin. And this is your output enable for reading data and VPP used for programming where you can apply high voltage. Uh, as you have seen, high voltage is required for uh, charging the floating gate. Then comes the floating uh, flash memory chip organization. This is 28F020 chip having 256K into eight organization. So it is also byte organized having D0 to 7, uh, eight data lines. And as you can see, 18 address lines are required to access 256K uh, flash memory locations. And these are essentially chip enable, uh, output enable, and this is for reading purpose, and this is for programming purpose, PPP. So we have seen different types of memory organizations. Now you may be asking uh, how, uh, whenever the chip is bit organized, how do you make it uh, addressable in terms of bytes? This is done by organizing by using eight chips to form a memory bank. Eight chips to form a memory bank. Here I have shown eight chips to form a memory bank. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then you will require 
8. So 8 chips are required. This will generate say D7 and this will generate D0. So each chip will generate one bit of data D1. In this way each chip will generate one bit of data. This is how a memory bank is formed. So this is your memory bank. How do you access it? So far as the uh, data lines are concerned, here you get eight data lines and one each coming from uh, one memory chip. You have to provide chip select. So chip select is, so this is your chip select which is coming. So chip select has to be applied in parallel to all the chips. Chip select which is generated by some circuitry later on we shall see all are will be applied in parallel to all the chips so to all the eight, eight chips it will go similarly the address which is coming in this case let's assume the organization is 4k into 8 so it will require 12 address lines a0 to 11 so these 11 address lines 12 address lines are provided in parallel. So here it will go, it will go to this chip, it will go to this chip, it will go to this chip, it will go to this chip. So all will be applied in parallel. So by applying the address lines and chip select lines in parallel, you get the data lines separately from each of the chips. D0 to D7. This is how you can form a memory bank. You may be asking why we are unnecessarily doing it when it is available in byte organized form. The reason for that is the chip count, pin count. It has been found that if you make it bit organized, the number of pins required is lesser. For example, for 4K and 8 organized, 8 memory chip, you will require uh, 12, if it is bit or byte organized, you will require 12 address lines plus 8 data lines apart from various other uh, pins for uh, supply voltage, uh, read write control, chip select and so on. On the other hand if it is bit organized then you will require 12 for address plus 1 for data and these numbers will be same for voltage for uh, read write control and chip select. So you see you require seven pin, uh, number of pins required is uh, less by seven. That's why the cost of a bit organized uh, chip having the same capacity will lower compared to byte organized chips. However, you require eight chips, minimum of eight chips to form a eight bit word. So in the system, you will require minimum of eight chips. Obviously, whenever you are making a big system, uh, then you, you require larger capacity memory where bit organized memory is commonly used. On the uh, other hand, when you are making a low cost system where the number of chip count is very important, that means you want to realize a system with minimum number of chip count and where the memory requirement is not very high. In such a case, you can go for byte organized memory because uh, maybe only one chip uh, will serve your purpose. But both are available as you have seen. For example, this DRAM, we have seen that DRAM usually has high packaging density. Since it has got high packaging density, obviously the uh, total number of at this line will be very high. That's why uh, it, it is not only made bit organized, but address is also provided in Time division, time division multiplex form and as a consequence the total number of pins required in DRAM is much less compared to SRAM where it is uh, address is provided in uh, without any multiplexing and all the data lines are available uh, in byte organized form. So this, this chip 64k by 1 chip in address multiplex form and bit organized form will have very few pins, for example, 8 plus 1, 9, 10, 11, 
twelve thirty, and then supply voltage and ground. So just by having sixteen pin chip, you can have sixty four k into one dynamic ramp. So uh, uh, both are used, and you have to select depending on your requirement. Now we are interested in interfacing different types of memories to your system, to your CPU. You have got your CPU on one side. Here is here is your CPU, CPU, or you can call it the microprocessor, mic microprocessor on a chip. which is a semiconductor device let's assume this side you have got your cpu now as you know cpu is provided with address bus address bus it is provided with data bus and also it is provided with control bus control bus is shown by using two way because some control lines are going from the system from the cpu and some control lines are coming to the cpu so and this address bus data bus and control bus together forms the system bus as you know system bus of the cpu now this is your cpu side on the other hand if you look at look at the memory devices here you will have different types of memories you will require ram you will require rom at least one rom and one ram will be required so uh, this ram and this rom these two are to be interfaced to the CPU. As you have seen, the RAM and ROM chips have their own uh, uh, signal inputs, address, data, and uh, various uh, signals, as you have discussed. So these are to be interfaced. Here also you will require address, data, and some control signals coming out from this uh, processor. But unfortunately, the signals which are generated by the CPU and signals which are required by the memory devices may not be identical. And this has led to some incompatibilities. That means some incompatibilities are present. What are the different types of incompatibilities that we shall discuss one after the other? Let us see what are the incompatibilities that exist. First of all, bus incompatibility what do you mean by bus incompatibility in bus incompatibility you will see that the uh, the uh, the particular processor which which is generating the system bus is not compatible with the bus of the different types of memory devices so in such a case what you have to do how do you overcome that problem first of all uh, let us see what are the different types of bus incompatibilities that exist? First of all, we have seen that in some microprocessor, the address that is generated is available in time division multiplex form. We have seen that it, in case of 8085 microprocessor, the addresses are generated in time division multiplex form. On the same lines, you generate the address first then you generate, then you can receive or send data, AD 0 to 7. On the other hand, RAM will require address, all the address lines simultaneously, and separate line for data. So you see here, here the address is generated, here for example, AD 0 to 7, dwell, dwell function, this, this lines, should be available in demultiplexed form here. How do you do demultiplexing? So for that purpose, you will require some additional device inside the 
I mean, um, before you can interface it. So in between the CPU and the memory, you will require some extra hardware. So which is shown here. For example, you will require a latch. Inside the latch, you will require a deep flip flop. So here you will apply, say, AD027. And this latch, this is your Q, Q bar. This is applied to a driver. And here it is available and uh, in, the, in the latched form. And latching is done with the help of ALE. We know that at this latch enable signal is generated when these lines, AD02 lines are having the address. So with the help of this ALE signal, this can be latched. And here you get your uh, addresses in, in the multiplex form. So the here you get, uh, you will have several such flip-flops, eight, and here you will get A027. So A027 is available here. And these data lines obviously will go directly to form the D027. Same, same AD027 forms the data lines. These data lines will be having. Now, so far this is how we'll, with the help of a latch, which is a 74LS373 is the uh, latch chip. This is the latch that can be used for this purpose. In fact, this is not, not the only chip. Let me have a detail of this chip. What, what are the different types of latches available? So this is 74LS373. In a, within a single chip, you have got eight flip-flops and drivers, as you can see. So uh, whenever this is zero output control, then you see, then you get the output. Whenever this is one, then of course output is not available. Output is tight stated. And the data can be latched by applying a clock to this input, this input. And so uh, you have got uh, one, two, three, four, eight input lines and out, uh, eight output lines. Here the inputs are available in time division multiplex form. And then these are latched in eight flip flops inside it. And whenever this is enabled with the help of this output control, you get the addresses, whatever you apply here for the remaining part of the time. So this is one chip. Another chip is 8282, which is also 8-bit uh, latch and internal configuration is same. Only difference is in the pins, as you can see here. Here it is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, available serially. Here, of course, it is not uh, organized in, in um, I mean, consecutive pin lines. So inputs and outputs are, are not available in serial form. So here three is input, two is output. Here at one is input, uh, uh, 19 is output. So one plus 19, 20, two plus 80. So here you can remember easily uh, by, two, by adding, you get the 20, which is the pin count. So both the chips have pin count of 20. So for easy uh, remembering the pin count, uh, this has been done in case of 8 to 8. So one of these two latches can be used for overcoming this uh, bus incompatibility. Apart from this bus incompatibility, another problem is, you see, we have seen that memory devices will require some read write control signals so the read write control signals which are which are generated by the cpu may not be identical to the read write control signals required by the memory devices may not be available in the same form for example in case of your 8085 it is generated in this way you generate uh, iom the cpu generates io slash m then read and write. Let's assume 
the re memory devices require separate uh, signals like memory read memr memw ior and iow that means memory read memory write io read and io write you have to you require signals the memory control signals in this form where the, the cpu generates in this form so you will require additional hardware in this case you will require some gates say iom is applied here and read is applied here to generate memory read whenever both of them are high both of them are this is an and gate whenever both of them are low you will get uh, both of them are high you will get uh, low here that means you, you will require uh, iom low so this is low means uh, this has to be low this has to be also low whenever both of them are low then output will be low memory read that means when read is low iom is low you will get memory read similarly you will require another signal memory write memory write you have to apply this one and also this iom signal to get memory read similarly this io write you can generate you have to apply this signal as well as this read signal and you get the io write signal similarly you will require you will get io write by having by applying this this signal io write this this has to be low here all this has to be low and io read signal this write signal has to be applied to this and you will get io write so in this way by using additional gates you can generate these uh, signals so uh, in addition to this latch, you will require some extra hardware to resolve this bus incompatibility. So we have seen how by using additional extra hardware, additional hardware or extra hardware, you can overcome the bus incompatibility. Apart from this bus incompatibility, you have got two more incompatibilities, that is your electrical incompatibility and timing or speed incompatibility. So we shall discuss about these two incompatibilities one after the other. First let us consider the uh, electrical incompatibility. By electrical incompatibility I mean the CPU is provided with some driving capability. That means voltage, current, uh, the, this, this, these are the electrical parameters. So the, since both the devices are based on semiconductor device technology and assuming that they use the same technology, the supply voltage will be same for both cases. However, the current drive capability may not be identical. So uh, whenever the CPU is driving a large number of chips, whenever uh, the chip, the system requires a large number of chips, the CPU may not be able to drive all the chips simultaneously. How do you overcome that problem? This can be overcome by using by using bus drivers. You can use bus drivers. What is what do you mean by bus driver? For example, this is your microprocessor or CPU, whatever you call it, and this is your address bus, this is your data bus, and these are the various control signals, control bus. What you can do, uh, instead of directly applying these lines, address, data, and control, you apply them through some bus driver. So this is your tri-state, you will require tri-state, tri-state bus driver and then this is applied to the memory devices memory and io devices 
Similarly, here you will require unidirectional tri state driver because address lines are unidirectional, it goes from CPU to the uh, memory and IO devices. On the other hand, the data bus will require bidirectional. bidirectional bus tri-state driver and this will go to the data bus of the memory device. So this side will go to will go to memory devices. So this will go to memory devices. Similarly your control bus some of them are going from the microprocessor to the memory or I.O or some are coming from the memory and I.O to the processor. So here also you will require unidirectional tri-state tri -state driver. So we find that you require both unidirectional tri-state driver as well as bidirectional tri-state driver. They can be realized by using some kind of drivers of this type. Say here you will apply some input and you will get some output say DI and, and here is the active high or low uh, enable line. With the help of this line it can be active low in that case you will put a put a circle here small circle then it is low active and whenever this is low whatever you apply here you get but with higher current current drive capability and whenever this is not active in this case it is low active so whenever it is high output is tri stated tri stated means you get high impedance output here so this is a tri state tri-state unidirectional bus driver. You can also realize bidirectional bus driver in this form in the by, by connecting two drivers back to back. So here this is one side, this is another side. Obviously you will require two signals and which, key gen which can be generated by NAND gates. Say here uh, this is your direction and this is your cheap enable, this is your enable. So that means whenever this line is high and this line is low, this output is 1 and then uh, it goes from A to B, AI to BI. On the other hand, whenever both of them are low, this is 1, that means the direction is low and enable is also low. I mean this enable has to be low for both cases in both direction of data transfer. Then whenever this is uh, low, this is also low, it goes from B to A. So with the help of these two signals, you can have uh, bidirectional data transfer and whenever this enable input, enable input is say 1, then you get tri-state. And whenever your direction input is 0, then you get from B to A, this is your uh, direction and whenever it is 1, then you get from A to B. So by using this type of drivers, you can have high current drive capability but uh, and also tri-state feature. So this type of devices may be required uh, for interfacing and here are some of the uh, drivers which are commercially available which can be used. This is a uh, 74LS244. This is unidirectional tri-state buffer or driver. On the other hand, 74LS245 is bidirectional. by directional tri-state buffer. Here what we have done, uh, I mean what has been done, eight similar, the, uh, the same type of drivers 
have been housed within a single chip. So a single chip accommodates eight drivers. So it can be used to uh, directly as a uh, say two such chips can be used for address bus and you have separate control for four lines. For example, uh, A1, A2, A3 and A4. These four are controlled with the help of this signal, a G1 bar, that is which is available, all available on pin number one, whereas uh, 2A1, 2A2, 2A3 and 2A4, these, are, these inputs are controlled with the help of this signal, G2 bar, which is available on pin number 19. And so this is also a 20 pin chip with the help of which you can make it uh, 8 bit address bus driver. Here, uh, on the other hand, these are bidirectional bus drivers, and again, a 20 pin chip has been used 74LS245, where uh, pins are available in this way 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. These are the, uh, this, these lines can be connected to one side, and they are on the other hand, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, and 11. This can go to the other side, and with the help of these two pins, you can connect, you can control the direction as well as you can also control whether the output will be tri-stated or not. You may be asking why tri-stating is required? Why these drivers must be tri-state? The reason for that is uh, later on we shall see sometimes you have to use DMA mode of data transfer when you have to perform high speed data transfer. In such a case the CPU has to relinquish the control of the system bus. How do, does it relinquish the control of the system bus? It has to tri-state the output. So whenever the CPU is directly connected to the memory and IO devices, when it goes to the DMA mode, automatically the address lines, data lines are tri-stated. But whenever you are using such chips for interfacing the memory and IO devices, uh, the output of these chips must be tri-stated whenever the CPU goes to uh, DMA mode of data transfer. That's why you require tri-state uh, drivers for both the cases. Now comes the third problem that is your timing and speed compatibility. Here I have shown the timing and speed incompatibility uh, to illustrate that this is the timing diagram for uh, reading from a memory chip. The when after you apply the address, after you apply the chip select, you can see there is a delay between the generation of the address and the generation of the chip chip select, which is uh, and that delay after some that uh, this, is, this is known as chip enable uh, to output time. Chip enable to also sorry this time this time is the del some delay is there. And after this chip is enabled, then you get valid data after some time. And this time is known as TCO. Uh, uh, this is your, sorry, this will be your TCO and this is your so TOC and this is your TCO. TC, TOC chip enable to output line. After you enable the chip, there is some delay. And here you get your data. And you can see after the address is generated, applied to the CPU, the, the memory device takes some time, which is known as access time, T access time, and after that valid data is available. So your read cycle time, minimum read cycle time should be equal to the T access. So T access should be the minimum uh, read cycle time before which will not get valid data from the memory. Similarly, whenever you are performing writing, you will take some time at the setup time for uh, generating the uh, chip select signal, then TWP, which is the write pulse width that you require uh, for writing data, and then you get valid data. And after the valid data is available, you have to, you must provide some write recovery time before you can start another cycle. And minimum, that's why based on this, the minimum write cycle should be TAW plus TWP plus TWR. By adding these three times, you have to, this, this will decide the minimum time that is required for uh, reading from the memory devices. 
on the other hand if you look at the microprocessor microprocessor is running according to its own timing depending on the clock frequency it keeps on generating these t1 t2 t3 cycles for reading t1 t2 t3 cycles for writing so this is the time which is used for reading and this is the time this is the time that is used for reading for writing and this is the time which is for reading now uh, here you see uh, after you generate the address uh, the reading is done somewhere around here reading has to be finished somewhere here now to do that you will require For example, uh, the microprocessor will take time which is known as T at this setup time. At this setup time, after you apply the address within the chip, that address will be available to the outside of the chip after some time. Similarly, you will require some data set setup time TDS. And this has been found to be about 225 nanosecond for say 8085. So assume, assume, let us assume that the clock frequency, clock frequency, uh, based on the clock frequency, your uh, time period, or uh, time period is, is equal to 320 nanosecond. That means we are assuming that this time, time period is 320 nanosecond. And based on that, as you can see here, you are performing the reading operation somewhere here. And you are starting the process here. So one clock cycle, another clock cycle, and half clock cycle. So you are spending about two and a half clock cycle for reading. That means two and a half plus into 320, roughly it is equal to 800 nanosecond. So 800 nanosecond is the total time. And 800 nanosecond, ha has to be TD, TAD plus TDS plus T access time. This should be uh, equal to 800 nanosecond. In, a, in other words, T access time, memory access time must be less than equal to 800 minus this 225. That is equal to roughly 575. So, 5 uh, the access time must be less than 575 uh, nanosecond, otherwise, we will not get correct data from the memory. If it is not, how do you overcome the problem? So, for proper data transfer, it is essential the memory device in this particular example must have access time less than 575 nanosecond. If it is not, what will happen? In such a case, how do you perform data transfer with slow memory devices? Let us discuss that. How do you interface slow memories? One simple, a simple solution is to slow down the clock frequency. You can instead of using say 320 nanosecond as the time period of the clock, you increase it. And in other words, clock frequency uh, is reduced. That is one solution, but that is not a good solution because in that case, the overall execution time or computation time will increase. What we want to do, only when we, you are performing memory read and memory write, that time you want to increase the time not in other times. So you can do that by using wait cycles. Provided the microprocessor has built-in feature for that. A microprocessor may not have built-in feature for incorporating wait cycle. If a microprocessor is having the built-in feature for incorporating wet cycle, then you can use this. For example, in case of 8085, fortunately, it has the provision for introducing, introducing wet cycle. 
what can be done in between T2 and T3 some wait cycle can be introduced because the CPU is provided with a special line known as ready line. With the help of that ready line, the ready line is sensed. If the ready line is low, then during T2, then in between T2 and T3, a wet cycle introduced. And you will require some, you have to use some extra hardware. Uh, here I have illustrated with an example how wet cycle can be introduced. Say ALE. Now this is one JK flip-flop, AL is applied to the clock, this is your Q, this is Q bar, this is clear input of the JK flip-flop. You use, we can use two JK flip-flops. This is your clock, clock of the microprocessor, and this is Q, and this is Q bar, this is clear. This is one input. Now this Q bar is connected to this feedback. Now I shall explain how this circuit can be used to generate the ready signal. Normally as the clocks come in, normally you see whenever the clock comes uh, depending on these values, say J, uh, uh, this, this value C, you see this is resetted by the ready. Since this is resetted, this Q will be 1 and this will be 0. So this is 1 and this is 0 means uh, the output will be this will be also 1 and this is 0. That means once it is cleared it will remain like that as you apply the clock. Now let us see what happens whenever it is you are using this clock to the to this input. This is your clock and A L is generated by the microprocessor. As you know, AL is generated uh, with every T1 clock period. So when T1 is low, you are generating the AL signal. Whenever an AL comes, since both the lines are 1, since this is not grounded, as you know in TTL, uh, uh, when these J and K inputs are not counted, not grounded or kept open, they are treated as 1. Or uh, one. That means when this, when both of them are one and a clock is applied, the Q will be one and Q bar will be zero. So Q bar Q will be one and Q bar will be zero. And next, and then whenever this clock comes at this age, so this will be shifted. So this is one, this is zero. So this will also become one and zero. One and since this you are taking from here, this will become zero. So this 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 output goes to low. However, as it goes low, this will reset this particular flip-flop. As it resets, this becomes 1 and this becomes 0. So in the next clock class, at this age, T2 clock age, again it will go high. And it will remain high until another really comes. Now, if this is applied to the ready input of the microprocessor, during T2 clock period, this ready signal will appear to be low. So the microprocessor will generate a wet cycle. However, during this clock period, it finds that ready input is not low. So it will go to T3. So as you can see in this particular case, uh, a wet cycle is introduced. This is your wet cycle. Wet cycle has been introduced, which is, a, which is an additional clock period in between two to T2 and T3 so that a slow memory can be interfaced. Now the total time required from here to here is instead of 5 by 2 clock period, it will require 7 by 2 clock period. And obviously, uh, obviously the, the access time of this memory, uh, slow memory will be able to perform the data transfer. So this is how you can perform the, uh, you can perform interfacing with slow memories. With this, we stop here today. Uh, let us summarize what we have discussed so far. We have discussed hierarchical memory organization.
in this hierarchical memory organization we have discussed different types of memories which are used uh, main memory secondary memory uh, and backup memory devices however we have mainly restricted our discussion to the interfacing of only main memory devices and we have we have discussed the organization of different types of main memory devices like ram rom they are not only their internal organization we have also discussed how a chip is uh, realized chip organization of this uh, these memory di uh, different types of memories then we have also discussed the various types of incompatibilities that we encounter whenever you interface the cpu with the main memory devices the main the three types of incompatibilities which you have discussed in this lecture are bus incompatibility and we have seen how this bus incompatibility can be overcome with the help of extra hardware then we have discussed electrical incompatibility and we have also discussed how electrical incompatibility can be overcome with the help of suitable driver uh, circuits like uh, uni unidirectional driver bidirectional driver we can increase the drive capability so this is how the electrical incompatibility can be overcome finally we have discussed the uh, speed incompatibility which can be also considered as the timing incompatibility where we have seen if this processor is not compatible with the memory devices then we can use the wait cycles and we can generate wait cycles with the help of additional hardware so that the slow memory devices can be interfaced to the uh, microprocessor so uh, these are the topics which you have covered so far on memory interfacing in the next lecture we shall see how the cpu can interface to a to different types of memories and how the cpu address space address space of the cpu can be uh, partitioned so that a number of uh, uh, ram and rom devices can be interfaced to it thank you